Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Real pleasure to welcome back to the program Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome back on a week. I should just note that um, we're probably going to see the confirmation of the 200th member of the federal judiciary, uh, which is about seven more than Donald Trump had. Of course, Donald Trump had three Supreme Court justices to appoint and uh, Joe Biden only one. But um, at the very least, at least there's been some uh, balance. The Biden administration done a much better job uh, with judges than the Obama administration did. Uh, but yet here we are. Um, Definitely better than the Obama administration. Um, the Biden administration has not gotten as many judges on the courts of appeals yet, which is an issue because they are so powerful and decide the majority of cases. You know, most cases don't even get to the Supreme Court. But that's in part because a lot of conservative judges are timing their retirements more strategically than left leaning judges. And uh, Trump got to flip a number of seats because left leaning judges on the courts of appeals stepped down to often take big law firm jobs because they wanted to put their kids through school and conservative judges don't do that under democratic presidents i think it's just a little bit more than just putting them through school i have a <laughs> feeling when you get those jobs uh you're also uh getting a pool and um and and more uh but uh be that as it may um and also i gotta say it's also a function of the types of people who were chosen to be judges under the Obama administration or, frankly, in those prior uh, Democratic uh, administrations, a lot of corporate judges. Absolutely. A lot of corporate judges, a lot of prosecutors who uh, uh, all sort of expected to be making the big bucks at this stage in their lives. And of course, federal judges make a few hundred thousand dollars, not the millions that a law firm partner does. And so I agree, this was a huge problem with a lot of Obama's appointees. You know, some of them held out till Biden and stepped down in their 50s under Biden, which is fine. Um, but I think we'll see a very different pattern with some of Biden's judges, most of Biden's judges, because when you're drawing from public defenders, civil rights attorneys, voting rights attorneys, these are folks who know how to make a good life with a few hundred thousand dollars a year in salary. They're not going to cut and run because they need an expansion of their house or another pool or whatever. Uh, and I'm, I'm, optimistic that more of Biden's appointees will serve long terms and and cling on under the next Republican president and make a stark distinction with some of Obama's rather corporate prosecutors. Yep, I, I hope so, too. All right. In the meantime, um, one thing uh, or at least, uh, you know, one of the things that was good that came out of the Obama administration in the Dodd-Frank um, uh, which didn't really go far enough as far as uh, some of us are concerned. But um, one of the good things that came out of it was the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was actually sort of like uh, Elizabeth Warren's um, uh, uh, baby in some ways. Um, and one of the things that was unique about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to insulate it from politics was to make sure that it was funded um, by fees it was collecting from financial service or, um, uh, uh, entities and uh, through fines. Um, and this was the grounds in which it was attacked. And it's been, what's amazing is this is, we've, I feel like this is such a repeat. Um, yeah, so it actually draws most of its money from the Federal Reserve, which itself collects money from interest on securities. So it also does collect, of course, fines and fees. That's its main enforcement mechanism. Um, but yeah, I mean, the CFPB has been under assault since the day it was created, and the Supreme Court struck down a small part of the law that created it in 2020 by holding that the president can fire its director. Uh, as Elizabeth Warren created it, it was supposed to have one director director who served a five-year term and the president couldn't fire the director unless they did something really, really bad. The Supreme Court struck down that protection, which ironically ended up benefiting Joe Biden more than anyone else because he was able to fire Trump's terrible CFPB director on day one uh, and install uh, progressives to lead it. Uh, but this is the other part of the attack, which is this idea that because the CFPB draws its money 
primarily from the Federal Reserve, it's unconstitutional. Now, just to hear that sentence, you might be scratching your head and be like, what is what could possibly be wrong with that? Uh, a bunch of payday lenders and their lawyers at Jones Day, the law firm, concocted this theory that federal programs and federal agencies have to be regularly funded by Congress in a bill that's stamped with the word appropriations. And that if Congress chooses to fund an agency any other way, including the way the CFPB is funded, it's unconstitutional and must be struck down in its entirety. And I just want to be clear, uh, these, these groups, these litigants and their lawyers, they shopped this theory to seven different courts, which all turned it down, basically laughed it out onto the street before they landed their case at the Fifth Circuit and found a willing audience at the Fifth Circuit, which struck down the entire CFPB, which led to this decision. So it's another good example of how these litigants will just go shopping to court after court until they find one, usually the Fifth Circuit, that's crazy enough to bite. That's what happened with a lot of Joe Biden's vaccine mandates, and it's what happened here. If someone was to do a word cloud of every conversation that we have had on this program for the past four years um, about uh, le about legal cases, the biggest two words w would be in huge bold Fifth Circuit. Um, and, and, and then administrative state after that, uh, the, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> and then Chevron probably yes. doing but, the Lord's work, trying to get people to care about the administrative state. I appreciate Well, it. but, but, but the, the fifth circuit, I mean, this is, this is so messed up. And then I guess the other one would be, uh, me mispronouncing that, uh, judge Kazansky or whatever his name is. <laughs> in, Kazmarek, Kazmarek, who is within the fifth circuit. In, exactly. Within oh, the fifth one. circuit. Oh, there we go. <laughs> but, yeah. but before we get to, to just that one point, I just want to say the first thing that popped out uh, for me. And I think uh, Kagan ended up bringing this up was that that's how social security is funded. Like social security is non-discretionary spending, which means that Every year, there is no word appropriations for Social Security because Congress does not appropriate money from the from the general budget to Social Security. It is its own self-funding mechanism. They may have to uh, raise the taxes at one point uh, to, to get it, to, you know, the, to, to refund the, the trust fund. But Social Security cannot add to the deficit. It is not part of the yearly budget. Um, and the... <laughs> it's the that's like the half of the government so social security medicare medicaid pretty much every other financial regulator including the federal reserve and the fdic a bunch of other agencies going back to pretty much the 1790s all of them are funded in ways different from how the fifth circuit said everything has to be funded the fifth circuit made up this theory out of whole cloth and essentially declared that trillions of dollars worth of spending and many, many, many parts of the government itself are simply unconstitutional and have to be struck down, sort of destroyed by judicial fiat. I think the good news is that the Supreme Court rejected that by a seven to two vote. The bad news is that it even got to the Supreme Court in the first place because of the Fifth Circuit's total insanity and depravity. And of course, that two justices still saw fit to dissent and attempt to, uh, we can talk about this, basically trigger a recession that would have destroyed the country. I, I want to talk about that 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 part of the, the two, but w walk us through, um, because maybe there's a good time to illustrate what why the Fifth Circuit like, how does our federal judiciary system, like, how does the Supreme Court get cases? And also, what happened to the attempt to stop the judge shopping? Uh, I mean, I was under the impression that the uh, the the federal judges had got together and said, we're going to stop this judge shopping thing. And then it turned out to be more of like, we think that people should stop uh, judge uh, shopping. Yeah. Uh, so for your second question, that's basically what happened. Uh, there there was a rebellion amongst the judges who like being shopped to, people like Matthew Kaczmarek, when the federal judicial conference said we're going to curtail judge shopping. All of these guys in the Fifth Circuit and the district courts within the Fifth Circuit said, absolutely not. How dare you? This is outrageous. Did like a full court press. And so the judicial conference ended up sort of walking that back and urging individual courts to adopt these new guidelines, which 
many courts did not, including the Northern District of Texas, which is where Judge Kaczmarek and many other wackadoodles sit. Uh, and so we are still dealing with this problem. Of course, this case originated years ago, so it wouldn't have been directly affected by this. But I, you know, there's more that the Supreme Court can do. And one thing it can do is in cases like this one, add a note at the end saying, by the way, we see how egregiously engineered this case was to be placed before the Fifth Circuit for no reason. And part of our decision is rooted in our disgust with how the lower court here manipulated the rules to help the litigators. Of course, the Supreme Court didn't do that because they're still cowards and they're afraid to tackle this problem directly, but it, it's continuing to boil. And it's something worth keeping an eye on because the court does have other tools. And of course, Congress could step in at any time and fix this, but Republicans don't want it to. OK, so w walk us through for, for people to understand how our federal judiciary works, because I said 200 judges. You said not the circuit court because we were talking about the federal district courts. Um, and what what's the difference? Just walk us through the different hierarchies and how a, a case makes it to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So for the vast majority of cases, a, a, a lawsuit or complaint is filed in a federal district court. The federal district judge in that court gets to oversee the case, issue a decision. In theory, cases are supposed to be randomly assigned to these judges. By law, in fact, cases are randomly assigned to one judge on the court. So even though it's called the Northern District of Texas, for instance, that's one court, it has a bunch of different judges who sit on it. But what these judges have done is put themselves in what are called single judge divisions. So they'll set themselves up in places like Amarillo, Texas, or Wichita Falls, Texas, where they are the only federal judge in that geographic area and they will invite litigators to walk into their courthouse and file a case which is then not randomly assigned to any judge within that district court but assigned directly to them that is what matthew kaczmarek keeps doing he just recently by the way blocked the new law that congress enacted and directed biden to implement that closed the gun show loophole um so this is still very much happening Whatever that judge does, it then gets appealed to the Court of Appeals that oversees those courts. So here for Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, that is the fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. The vast majority of cases, something like 99% of cases, they end at the Court of Appeals, right? The Supreme Court is lazy. The Supreme Court only takes like 60 cases a year. Even Brett Kavanaugh says that that is a ridiculously low load, and he's right. So most of these cases are just ending at the circuit courts. And the circuit court, therefore get to make most of the law in the country. Even if a circuit court gets it wrong, it might not be a decade, even 20 years until the Supreme Court steps in to reverse it. The Supreme Court can take its sweet time. So this is how and we just get to be clear. Like you could have one set of laws essentially in the Fifth Circuit Correct. and another one in the Eighth Circuit or uh, the, the Fourth Circuit. Correct. And that is when the Supreme Court's supposed to step in. We call that a circuit split. But again, the Supreme Court has gotten kind of lazy or gun shy or something, and it hasn't been resolving those splits. So we have very different law in different parts of the country. And that is especially true when it comes to immigration law, because the Ninth Circuit oversees uh, California and it's very liberal and the Fifth Circuit oversees Texas and it's extremely conservative. So basically migrants who come in through Texas have a much lower chance of being able to vindicate their rights under law, like the right to seek asylum and have a, a credible fear of persecution hearing if they come in through Texas than in California. And we should say the reason why uh, the Fifth Circuit, Texas, Louisiana, um, uh, Mississippi and Mississippi versus um, uh, the, the, the circuit, uh, the California circuit is because the senators nominate from these states, nominate these people to the uh, that court. And if they don't want um, if they have a problem or, or they suggest, I should say, uh, to the White House. The White House then nominates those people, but if they have a problem with it, they withhold their blue slip. And, of course, only Democrats now, when they're chairing the Judiciary Committee, recognize that tradition. When the Republicans come in, blue slips are no longer effective. Uh, That's exactly right. For, for circuit court judges especially. And so when Trump came in, 
Uh, the Senate got rid of blue slips. Mitch McConnell was like, we're not doing this. We are stacking the courts of appeals because Mitch McConnell, better than anyone, understands that you don't have to win elections if you can just capture the courts. They will do everything for you. Um, and so McConnell held open or directed Texas' senators to hold open seats on the Fifth Circuit under Obama. So when Trump came in, it wasn't just that some judges strategically retired, though they did. It was that there were vacancies awaiting Trump because Republican senators had used the blue slip process to keep those seats open and ensure that a Democratic president wouldn't be able to fill them. That's why today the Fifth Circuit has this lopsided majority of sort of, I call them judicial arsonists, judicial nihilists. They're a combination of Trump appointees and insane appointees of previous Republican presidents who have sort of banded together to be the vanguard of the new conservative right. And they're, they're uh, I mean, it's likely, it seems to me, that if Donald Trump gets into office and uh, has a um, uh, a seat or two available on the Supreme Court, the Fifth Circuit's going to have a, uh, a, a there, there's going to be a nominee yeah. from that that circuit, right? Yeah. So that's the other thing that's going on here. A lot of auditioning. The judges yeah. on the Fifth Circuit appointed by Trump all think they're going to be the next Supreme Court appointee under a Republican president, probably Trump 2.0. So we have people like Jim Ho, who is uh, going out there doing this tour, talking about how judge shopping is amazing, it's the best thing ever, that it's horrible that anyone would ever oppose it. He talks about abortion as this moral tragedy. He condemns like abortionists all the time. He talks about how liberals want to bring the woke constitution into effect and we need like these brave conservative warriors for the judiciary to stop them. I mean, he's like a Fox News talking head. Similar thing with Andrew Oldham, similar thing with Kyle Duncan. These are the Trump appointees who go out there. They're the ones boycotting Columbia. They say they won't hire law students as clerks from Columbia because of the protests. They're the ones who go on TV, go to sort of student groups and shout at them and say things like, you know, you're all woke liberals. Uh, they, they are auditioning to get a seat under the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court might try to send these signals to them too subtly, in my view, that they should rein it in. But to them, that just proves they're doing a good job because universally, I think at this point, like the thought leaders of the Republican legal right think that Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, and Neil Gorsuch were all mistakes and that they need to do better next time. Right. They all th think of them as like suitors. Squishes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and suitor was appointed just for 90% uh, of you who don't remember this, yeah. uh, was appointed by George uh, Herbert Walker Bush. And um, was it a little too much of a New England conservative? For too much of a New England conservative. Uh, we should be clear that the, these people are not suitors, though. Like, <laughs> you know, no, no, right. oh, no, no, exactly. It's it's the next it's next model. And the next model comes out. They are their suitors as far as these conservatives in uh, in Texas are concerned. Yes. But they're completely bat crap crazy on if uh, we use just normal, um, uh, you know, uh, legal theory as a exactly. baseline. Um, you know, we've just gone from, uh, you know, I mean, these guys at the Fifth Circuit are basically Marjorie Taylor Greene, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, but you know, well, Alito, maybe, to law school. Alito may be Marjorie well, Taylor Greene as we, well. We, we, like, we, we, I know we'll get to that, but they already <laughs> have. Like, you're saying, Mark, that, you know, some of these guys are, are Fox News uh, judges. I saw, and I'm stealing this from somebody, I forget who tweeted it, but Alito's not a Fox News judge. He's a Newsmax judge with the, yeah. with what, like, we're at that level already. It's just a question of more numbers on the Supreme Court who would be in lockstep with a guy like Alito, I think. Yeah, uh, I think... I yeah. Right. Sorry, Before we get know, to Alito, let's gun. let's let's talk about uh, this uh, this other case out of Louisiana. Because... Well, I just wanted to briefly sort of wrap on the CFPB thing, if I can, yeah. because yes. I think that's a really good point. So, like the what happens is it's these payday lenders who are challenging the CFPB because they want to put these extortionist loans out and collect all this interest and screw people over. So the housing industry, which is like not a bleeding heart industry, let's be clear, like house housing people and bankers come into the Supreme Court and they're like, hey, we also don't really like the CFPB because sometimes it like finds us, but we just want to let you know 
that if you strike down the entire CFPB, and they told this to the Fifth Circuit too, but the Fifth Circuit didn't care. The CFPB actually provides what we call safe harbor protections for housing lenders and builders. So if you sort of follow these basic rules and you are sued uh, and you're a housing lender, you can rely on the CFPB's protection to fight away that lawsuit, to fight away legal liability. If that is taken away, which is what would happen if the CFPB is struck down, lenders would not lend anymore, okay? Because they would be subject to endless litigation and liability for anything they do across all 50 states. There would be no federal umbrella protection. Lenders would stop lending, which means that builders would stop building, which means that both the loan and construction part of the housing industry would dry up entirely. The banking industry, of course, relies on that aspect of lending to keep its own assets going. So the banking industry would likely tip over into a collapse like 2008, which would set off almost certainly a global recession. This is not hypothetical. This is one of the key features of the CFPB that we don't talk about enough. It wasn't just protecting consumers from payday lenders and all that stuff. It was shoring up the industry so that it could have a set of rules that would prevent a collapse like 08. And so if Sam Alito and Neil Gorsuch, who are the two dissenters in this case, if they had gotten their way, if they had destroyed the CFPB, we would not be having a conversation right now. We would be running to our banks to, to withdraw as much money as possible to stash under our beds because this case was quite literally a direct challenge to America's ability to maintain a functioning economy in 2024. Uh, it's a good lesson, too. If uh, if you have a, a cousin or a, a little brother who is a libertarian, ask them how we work that out uh, between our own separate private judiciaries uh, that would uh, deal with, um, uh, you know, lawsuits against lenders in that instance. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.